Uh, welcome. I know we're just getting back from break. My name is Tom LaRusso. I'm a user research lead at Xbox at Microsoft, working on the Xbox platform. Uh, for the record, I was not nervous about this talk until I heard Pedgeman remind me that I have all of my peers and an ex-manager here. So now I'm a little more nervous than I was a few minutes ago. So thanks for that. Appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to be talking today about kind of a small case study we did around looking at gamers with deafness, with low hearing, reduced hearing, as well as low speech uh, and reduced speech. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk about it today. If the clicker works. No. Maybe this way. No. Maybe what, I don't want to hit down. What's down going to do? All right, what about this? Ah, oh, we'll just use that. Great. So, as I mentioned, it's kind of a smaller study, um, but I thought it was interesting to share for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we were looking outside of our core group of users. Um, two, we were looking at insights uh, that cut across gamers and games and the platform and hardware as well. So I know a lot of you are not working on platform or hardware, you're working on games, and these insights seem to cut across all of them. Thank you. All right. Backup clicker. Great. Um, so first, I want to give you a little bit of context about who we are, what my group does. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a research manager. I have a team about six or seven people who are working on the Xbox platform. This is pretty much anything you see on an Xbox that's not a game. So uh, the loading screen, the store, your collection, uh, all the social features. We also work on things that are not on the Xbox, so the PC app. Uh, pretty much any time you've had an Xbox and you've wanted to throw it out the window, it's probably my fault because it's probably some feature that didn't work for you, whether it was the party or friends, something like that. Um, and I'm lucky because my team is actually part of a, a really big research team in Windows that works on things like you know, Windows, mobile, HoloLens, uh, education, Edge browser, and some of the other apps. So we partner very closely with people who are working on the games themselves, um, but also people who are working on user experience across Windows and Microsoft, which has been fantastic. Um, for me personally, I've been in and out of games since about 2001. I had a slide up here with all the old box art that I worked on, but it made me feel like an old man because it was like Lynx 2004 and the original Xbox Live. Um, if you can remember the day where we didn't even have Madden or FIFA on Xbox, we just had Fever and uh, a hockey game that I worked on. So I didn't include that. But I do have an example of some of the social features my team is working on at the moment. Um, we're working on uh, looking for group and clubs, which are coming to Xbox. They're in preview at the moment. But just to give you a flavor of what the platform team does. So we cover a pretty broad span. So why look at something like gamers with deafness? Um, like every good user research story, this starts with a partner of ours who wanted to understand more about a user scenario. And like a lot of good stories, it also includes Destiny, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, so uh, being in user research, like a lot of you, one of our key partners is our design team. And at the time, August de los Reyes was the lead designer for the Xbox platform. A wonderful designer, um, but was also having a push around inclusivity and accessibility throughout Xbox and throughout Microsoft. I could do a whole hour talk on inclusivity and accessibility. This is just a real small case study for it. Um, I have a couple links at the end. If you want to grab me and talk more about the overall program, that'd be great, but I don't want to dive too much into it here. So August was at home. And he's a big Destiny fan, as am I. And he's trying to play Destiny, but he's having router issues where he can't chat with anybody on Xbox. Now, again, it's hard to imagine a world where the Xbox doesn't work perfectly, but it happens. We know it happens. Um, so he's sitting there saying, well, I can't talk. Has, any, has anybody played Destiny? It's got to be a few. And how about raids or even some of the more intense strikes, right? So could you imagine doing a raid is one of these things that's it's too even convoluted to talk about, but I love it. It's almost impossible to do without voice and team communication. So he was sitting there saying, you know, I can't communicate with people in Destiny. I basically have to put the controller down because I can't play. And given this push for accessibility and thinking about other groups, he came to me as a UR partner and said, how, how can people who can't use speech, uh, who can't hear and can't use speech to communicate, how do they play Destiny? And we talked and we talked, and it really boiled down to how do these people with low hearing and low speech game online on a console? Um, what about their daily lives? What kind of context they have in their daily lives that's going to influence the way they game? And then what can we learn about that group that's really going to help make social gaming better for everybody on Xbox? Now, that last point is worth talking about for a minute because one of the key tenets, one of the key values of anything around accessibility and, and looking at different user groups is that you're very often going to find insights and solutions that are going to work for everybody. So this is a relatively famous example. You can see the curb cut out there that all these people are using. At, at least in the US, this was a big push through the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act. 
And those curb cutouts were really designed for people in wheelchairs, which is a tiny amount of the population. Um, and it was part of an overall effort to make kind of the streets and the infrastructure more accessible. But as you can see here, all of these people are using it. I have two small kids, which means I have like 12 bicycles and five strollers somehow. Uh, so we use these curb cutouts constantly going to the corner and not having to go off a big curb. Uh, you, I was just this guy, you know, I guess yesterday, wheeling my giant suitcase uh, from Heathrow all around England. And it was great to have these curb cutouts, right? But that's an example of something that's really designed at a tiny percent of people that then benefits everyone. And frankly, we probably all take for granted. Um, there's lots of examples like this. I'm, I was kind of naive of, around this field about a year ago, but I've learned that the electric toothbrush and the bendy straw were really designed and used for people who had limited mobility, so you can't brush your teeth kind of vigorously, um, or you in a hospital where you couldn't put the cup exactly where you wanted it, you'd have to use the bendy straw. And again, we use those things all the time. So if you take nothing away from this talk, take away that doing this kind of work is going to help your entire audience, not just the small subset that we're talking about. So we've got our research questions. I've got my partner with design. Um, and so we go off to do this study. Now, in this case, we partnered with a vendor, because uh, again, I mentioned I'm a manager, so I don't do any real work. So we partnered with someone who could do the real work. Uh, her name was Julie at Ipso. She was fantastic. I want to make sure she gets a lot of credit for this work. Uh, I don't get commission, but if you're interested and you need to partner with someone on qualitative work, I, I highly recommend her. Great, so we'll just do a quick, quick overview of methods. Uh, this is actually relatively straightforward. The methods were not the innovative part here at all. Um, we did a focus on online console gamers with low hearing and low speech. Um, we limited it to console because we know that's just a different world than PC. PC is more friendly to a keyboard culture and typing and chatting. And in fact, we learned that in the study and we learned that through recruiting. Very easy to find console gamers with, with low hearing and low speech. Very easy to find online gamers, but that were on the PC. So we wanted to focus on this audience. Again, we knew it was relatively small, but we also knew there was a lot of opportunity to learn there. Um, we talked to 36 total participants. Really, the main quality would be that they would not feel comfortable relying on voice in a gaming situation. Um, we did 16 interviews, either in person or on Skype, um, so that we could talk to them. And this is an example of one. And then we did another 20 that was more like an online forum and survey where we could have a little back and forth. Um, so just to give you a little taste of the interviews, I'm going to play you this clip. I hope the audio works. Let's see here. I'm in college now. Oh. Video's I'm going to Governor State bit. University. And I like to play games a lot. Um, I also... Broadcast on Twitch, and that that's that's a gamers uh, broadcasting network. Okay. Um, my friend, my roommate uh, from college, um, is from RIT, and we have several projects um, that we call No Voice, the No Voice Zone, where we try to somehow um, make deaf people aware of gaming. You know, oh. that's what this shirt actually is, is showing. All right. Just play a little bit of that. Um, definitely not the first time someone has showed us a t-shirt or tried to sell us a t-shirt while we're doing user research. You guys might have had the same experience. But this just gives you a little taste for how we did the online interviews. Uh, we had Julie was there. We had an ASL interpreter, you know, uh, American Sign Language. And I thought this was a great clip because it's very clear that Chris is into gaming. It's part of his personality. It's part of his culture. He mentions gaming with his roommates. I'm not sure how well the audio came through for you guys. Um, but he's talking about playing. And then these t-shirts and these organizations he started is trying to get gamers with deafness playing even more. So clearly an, an Xbox fan, a gaming fan, and someone that we should be reaching out to and talking to. Just get back here. Great. So as we talked to those 36 people, we came up with these themes that I'm going to walk you through. You can take a quick look at that. We're just going to go through these each one by one. So the first one about is about, the first insight we got was very clear right off the bat, again, even through recruiting, was that death is not a single condition, and it doesn't have a one-size-fits-all answer. So naively coming in, I thought, oh, we're going to talk to gamers with deafness, and it's going to be like Chris. They will not be able to hear. They will not be able to speak. They'll have to use sign language, and it'll be pretty uniform. 
But that is very much not the case. Chris would be just at one end of what is a relatively wide spectrum of people who would identify as deaf or having deafness uh, or having reduced speech and reduced hearing. Um, they would talk, they, some folks could speak normally. You wouldn't know that they had reduced hearing, but they would use, be using, uh, excuse me, using lip reading. Uh, others were very much around ASL. There were plenty of folks who were using ASL and English was really their second language. So it was great to talk to them through an interpreter, but when you were um, talking to them through email or forums, it was a little more difficult because English really was their second language and an American Sign Language was their first, sign la was their first language. Um, and so it was very eye-opening to how we would approach those kind of studies and also approach our design solutions where you couldn't just say, oh, this is great, it works for someone with no hearing. You have to think about how it would work with someone with partial hearing. The other aspect of this was across the board, um, some sort of reduced hearing was not the only problem. People had other symptoms. Because again, they weren't just, some were, but not all of them were just born deaf and that was it. It was usually some sort of disease or problem or accident that also had other symptoms. So we had people that would get vertigo, that would have tinnitus, which is kind of a ringing in the ear, um, that would be overly sensitive to light and flashing light and things like that because they told us their, their visual senses got a little more developed. So again, you could imagine a design solution that's just like, oh, instead of audio cues, just have a bunch of fat flashing lights everywhere, um, or just turn the volume up, and that might affect these people differently. So you're all user researchers. You've worked with plenty of users. You know you can't define a user as just one thing. But again, it was eye-opening to say that deaf means a large range of things and also a large range of systems, uh, symptoms, excuse me. So, uh, Again, being user researchers, you know that people don't game in a vacuum. So this was our next kind of category of insights around how do these people's lives affect their mental state and their behavior when they show up for gaming? So we all know people don't just appear on a couch out of a cloud of smoke and want to play some Overwatch. They go through their day, they have experiences, and by the time they get home for gaming, they're in a certain mindset. With this particular audience, we heard tons of stories around difficult and awkward situations at work, with friends, um, trying to communicate something at work where the person was not going to put in the extra time for listening because it took a little bit extra, uh, trying to join a conference call when really they couldn't hear and they couldn't see the lips to help them understand what was going on. And a lot of it dealt with sort of anxiety and, and fear and stress. Um, so I could have picked a lot of these stories, but I wanted to pick one that was something that I take for granted. And again, at least in the U.S., you get off from work, you hit the drive through you get some fast food that's horrible for you, you sit down on the couch and you start gaming with friends, right? It's kind of like a rite of passage. Um, and for most of us, that sounds like a pleasant experience. In this participant's case, they have such issues with even something simple as ordering a drive through meal. Uh, you can see that they're worried about being judged, the speaker was horrible, they wouldn't feel comfortable, right? So instead of having a nice, easy experience before gaming, they're dealing with these things around anxiety and being judged, um, and that's gonna be in their brain when they sit down for the console. So again, we had tons of stories like this. So we could see right away that it was influencing and affecting their mindset when they would sit down for gaming. I call this my slide of shame because we're talking about gaming, we're talking about fun and entertainment, you should not be seeing things about isolation and uh, an anonymity and fear, right? But these are the kind of things we run into when you're dealing with like a social network and especially this audience that has concerns when they're in these social situations. So we had participants say, oh, I'm not even gonna try a headset. I don't want people to um, know that I'm deaf, so I'm gonna hide my deafness. The isolation is they just wanna play with people who are um, also deaf or play with people in that kind of situation. And then plenty of people just go over to the PC where they can use the keyboard and not have to worry about it. So not only are we losing potential customers, but we're putting people in a situation where they have to either play with people they want and deal with this sort of fear and judgment or go off to a different platform they may not even want to just for that reason. Um, the other one that was particularly bad was the self-worth, where we had people telling us stories that their friends, you know, people they met online, eventually said they wouldn't play with them anymore, they got kicked out of clans and guilds because they couldn't keep up because of all the um, real-time communication during, like, a Destiny or a first-person shooter, and that was genuinely heartbreaking. I think we all get upset when people bash our features, but these stories just made me feel bad as a person. Um, they, were, they were tough to listen to. So we talked a little bit about the gamers and the games and what about their experience. We're gonna talk about more about hardware in a minute, but one thing that came out very clearly was 
uh, this group considers a second screen device as a requirement. Now, we, I think everybody in this room probably has to use a second screen uh, in some way for when they're gaming and trying to group up with friends. I know for me, half the time, I'm texting people to make sure they get online. Um, but for this audience, it was absolutely a given. They use it for chat. They use it for video chat especially, because again, they're using ASL or lip reading, uh, and that's just how they communicate. And while they were fine using it, a lot of them did talk about how it was cumbersome, it was a pain, uh, it was just an extra thing they had to do. And they all wished that the device would, or the hardware that we worked on, the Xbox ecosystem, would do more of it for them. They saw it as kind of a crutch or a hack. And again, makes sense for this, uh, for this group, but something that could be applied to everybody. If we could make it so that you could actually game on Xbox without having to call somebody first or text them, um, it would be a lot easier for all of our gamers. So this is another group of insights. This is one of my favorite ones, um, something I never would have thought of. Um, and what we learned talking to these folks is that the communication is really the cornerstone for personal authenticity. And what I mean by that is the way people communicate with other people is really inherent in their identity. So I get to stand up here and talk to you. We can be talking in the lobby. For this audience, if you're using ASL, if you're using lip reading, um, we had many people who said, I've worked very hard to keep my speech up, even though I don't have hearing, so I do be able to want to speak. I don't want to have to use text. And what we found is, as we talked to them about solutions, like, well, what about text or what about text-to-speech? They were very adamant that they wanted to use the communication method that they were using with everyone else. If we couldn't let them use ASL on the Xbox, it was going to feel very much like they had to cater themselves to the gaming experience. And of course, we really want the gaming experience to cater to our users, right? We don't want to have to change our users. We want the technology to enable them and not try to change them. Um, and this made a lot of sense once you heard them talking about it. But you could tell how personal it was that somehow, even though our best attempts to say, well, you could use a keyboard or this or that, it felt like we were trying to fix them or change their behavior. And really, it hit home for me because it would be like somebody saying, oh, well, Tom, you can game. You just have to do it in a different way, or you have to learn German, or you know, something like that, where I say, well, no, I should be able to just do it the way I do, have communication in daily life. One extreme example of this was we had, we were being what we thought was good, having an ASL interpreter there for every session, and one of the participants got very upset. He said, I've worked very hard to be able to speak uh, and to be able to read lips, and I don't want to have to use an ASL interpreter. I want them out of the room, please. You know, we're not even going to start until we get that person out of the room, because again, you're treating them differently than they, are, than they see themselves. Uh, the next group of insights around captioning. Uh, I love this. I don't, I don't remember this exact scene, but you know, I'm sure it was hilarious. Um, captioning was the first thing everybody wanted to talk about. As soon as you sat them down, you got them online, they just want to talk about captioning, captioning, captioning. So why is this? Well, first of all, we know content is king. As a platform guy, I say content is king constantly. Nobody buys and turns on an Xbox for the party feature or the store. They buy it so they can play all the great content that you guys work on. Um, but what was interesting is that they talked about wanting the full gaming experience. And what they meant was that they understood that when things weren't captioned or captioned enough, that they weren't getting the same experience that their friends were getting, and they weren't getting the same experience that the game developers and all of you uh, tried to impart to them. So you could imagine that you know, they're watching this show, they don't see the exciting jazz music subtitles, because it wasn't subtitled. Um, they wouldn't get that joke in that play. And, they know because they're watching TV, they're watching movies. And even there, there's actually a range. I was going to be all cool and get a Sherlock you know, from the BBC because I'm in London. But it turns out if you go onto Netflix and watch Sherlock, they don't do any of this. They simply do the words being said. They don't do the gunshot in the distance or a scream or a cry or laughter. And I, I watched maybe half an episode of that, and it was, it was very lacking. You, know, you really miss a lot knowing or, or not knowing what else is going on in the background. The other way I like to pitch this is, you know, you're all in the room and use the research, you work with designers, you're trying to get that experience. Someone spent a lot of time agonizing that jazz music was the exact thing to be put in the background. Um, for me, I think of the Halo example where the artificial intelligence, the Marines would react to you and say, oh, you know, Master Chief's here, oh, they're throwing a grenade. People spend hours and hours trying to get that in experience and it's totally lost on this audience. Not only is it lost on this audience, but Again, having young kids, if I'm playing the game with the volume down, or if you're in a loud dorm room, or if you're having a technical issue where the sound works, then those people are losing it as well. So we really encourage captioning. I mean, it's, it's an obvious recommendation. We know it's expensive, um, but we've had some success in pitching it around design intent, meaning don't have a segment of users that don't get the full experience. Uh, and again, they will know that they're not getting the full experience, which you'll see in a minute. 
Uh, before I click the next slide, did anybody here work on Doom or Fallout? Okay, good, then I don't have to apologize, because we're going to show kind of a brutal, a brutal quote here. This could easily be an Xbox title, right? But it just so happened that someone was talking about these games. Again, one of the themes of this was that these gamers are savvy, like a lot of our gamers. They get more savvy every year. So they know that, okay, there are some subtitles, but yeah, for most of the dialogue, but not the cutscenes, not the cinematics. Um, they will just get the sense that, okay, I'm, I'm not getting the full experience. And then the last one, that is pretty extreme, but we just thought that was great, that this guy was just so upset that it did not come with subtitling. So again, the recommendation is uh, caption everything as much as possible, even though I know, trust me, I know it's expensive. And there's another side of captioning, which you may not think of, which goes along more towards the audio cue. So now I do get to use an Xbox game. Um, this idea that, you know, getting killed from behind is just annoying. In this case, because the person couldn't hear the footsteps. But even more than that, he was sitting next to his son. He knew his son could hear the footsteps. And so he's already knowing that he's on an unfair playing field. His son can hear something and has some experience that he's not going to be able to get. So when you think of captioning, think of not just the words and the dialogue and the sound effects, but also the in-game play. So if you're putting footsteps in there because you want someone who's you know, pretty skilled to be able to hear the footsteps, try to have some uh, non-audio version of that. Again, not to give them some unfair advantage, but to make the playing field more level. So another big theme we came across was hardware. This, don't be shocked, but this is a stock photo. This is not one of our participants. Um, this was kind of eye-opening to me. You know, I was very focused on the operating system and the features and the social features. But besides captioning and subtitling, we had a lot of people talking about the headphones. And it really came down to three things, uh, comfort, control, and then integration. So on the comfort side, uh, again, this is just another stock photo to show you what a hearing aid with a cochlear implant uh, looks like. And we had many participants had hearing aids, which again, when I think of a deaf gamer, I think of someone who can't hear, so why would they have a hearing aid? But in fact, a large group of people who have hearing issues or would consider themselves partially deaf have hearing aids, and a somewhat smaller percentage also have these implants. But you can see that it's up against the ear. Um, and what you can see there is the free headset that we give away, right? We give away with the box. And that has to go over the, over the ear. And hopefully, you can picture that being kind of uncomfortable. And then the one below that is one of these like sexy premium Turtle Beach devices that we all sort of lust after. So we had these participants telling us that the inbox ones were uncomfortable. Um, the, the kind of premium ones that were designed for gamers were uncomfortable. But more than that, they were telling us, look, here are these premium over-the-air headsets that are designed for gamers. I'm a gamer, but it's not designed for me, and I can't use it. Um, if you guys have glasses and you use those nice over-the-air headphones, you get the same thing probably, kind of pinches like I do. Kind of have to wear my glasses like this. You know, hopefully nobody will see me. Um, so again, it was, it was around comfort. It was around feeling less than or feeling like a second-class citizen. We heard that quite a bit in these conversations too, that they felt part of the gaming community, but the gaming community did not include them in a lot of experiences and the hardware. So one of the other ones was around control. So again, if you're, if you're thinking, oh, it's just a deaf gamer, it's you know, someone who can't hear, you're not going to be worried about volume control and audio mixing. But because we had such a range, there were people that could hear from one ear but not from the other, um, that certain frequencies resonated better or worse uh, than some of the other folks. So in this case, we got a lot of ass on the hardware for, hey, let me change each ear individually. Let me get individual chat channels. So if I'm, if I'm in a party with four people, this person, like myself, is yelling and is really loud. Other people are more quiet. Let me change that dynamically. Now, it's not too much of a leap to think that a person with normal hearing would also want this sort of chat channel mixing and, and be able to turn one person slightly down, another person slightly up. We're actually relatively bad about that in the Xbox platform right now. Um, but we also saw with some of the frequencies that people would have ear issues. So, you know, the dialogue would be fine, but then the explosions would be genuinely painful because it would shake some part of their ear that had been damaged or injured. Um, and so they extended not just wanting to mix up the chat, but also sort of the frequencies that things came in um, because there was such variability, uh, not just for themselves, but across that group of people. And the last one around, or the second to last one around hardware was around integration. So I didn't realize this, but a lot of the hearing aids had Bluetooth already. So we had uh, participants who were saying, well, why do I need to put on headphones at all? I have this thing attached to my ear. It's got Bluetooth. So just pipe the uh, music and the sound through that. And that was great for me because I could take that. Even though I don't work on the hardware team, I could go uh, talk to the hardware team about it. 
And again, most of you guys are working on games. You have no control over headphones or Bluetooth. I don't even have control over any of that stuff, even working on the platform. But it was just another example of where these people expect their gaming accessories and their gaming experiences to work with what they have, not that they should have to cater themselves to it. So it very much seemed like an extra step to have to deal with this uncomfortable headphone when they already have something on here. And so that was sort of the headphones and the comfort. Um, one of the other things we saw around hardware was this need for haptics. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I think it was, uh, make sure I get the show right, the Gadget Show. They spent like a half an hour on this TV show setting up this fully immersive Battlefield 3 environment. Um, so that person's got on a haptic vest, he's got 3D view, a 3D treadmill so he could go in any direction. I was drooling over this as a big Battlefield player. Um, so I thought it was great. So we didn't have anybody ask for this, but we did have people say, look, I, I don't have hearing. I know there's all these audio cues going on in the game. I would love it if my controller or an accessory or something, whether it's vibration or lights, could kind of give me a sense of where things are coming from, either where noise is coming from, where shots, like you mentioned, footprints. Um, we had, um, as participants are, you know, want to do, we had someone give me a whole, like, spec for the vest that they would design and how it would interact with the controller and the hardware and the lights. Um, which is great. Again, we're not going to get anywhere that far. So um, this, was, this was an example of them knowing they were missing out, trying to come up with solutions on their own, but feeling like there was a big gap, that we had all this fancy, expensive hardware, but you know, on the Xbox, at least, we have one rumble. You know, there's no left rumble, right rumble. It's just kind of a little vibration. Um, and they really saw that as a gap. And again, I can, I can take it back and work with the hardware team, but you guys might want to consider how to do more of that either make use of the current haptics or maybe something if you're working on mobile or the PC. Um, but again, it's more of a takeaway to how do you replace those audio cues that gamers depend on. So this is one of the last, kind of the last themes that we have. I'm trying to keep this nice and short. I know it's been a long day already. Um, and again, this audience is very savvy. They're savvy about value and they're savvy about what, what um, they're paying into this, uh, how much things cost. So they know that as a gamer, they have, they bought a TV, they bought an Xbox, they've got a controller. Uh, if they're live gamers, they've got a subscription to live already. Um, and so here we come as a game company saying, oh great, but look, if you, if you can't use voice chat, you can use a keyboard. You know, we'll, we'll make and design and sell you these keyboards. And so what we heard from these participants over and over again was, yeah, that's great, except now I have to buy another keyboard. Now I have to plug it in. It can interfere with, you know, my headphone jack. It's clunky. It's heavier. Uh, it eats up battery life. And, you know, most of them were appreciative of these kind of efforts, but it was an extra tax. Same thing with the headphones. It's like, yeah, you can totally go buy earbuds if you don't want over the ear, but then I got to buy an extra thing. Um, I can't use the ones that were designed for games and gamers. I have to go, you know, this kind of lesser experience because of my hearing. Um, one that was interesting to us is we said, well, you can do video chat on Xbox. We have Skype and, you know, we can, we can do multitasking. A lot of people did, had no idea that you could even do Skype on the Xbox, which is one issue. But many of them didn't do it because they saw it as an extra tax, right? You have to go buy a Kinect, uh, if you can find one. Um, you have to sign up for Skype. You have to deal with all that hassle. If you've ever played a game with something snapped on the side, you know, you lose your screen real estate. So most of them didn't even bother with that because they, they either thought it was an extra cost, an extra tax, or they had tried it and they knew it was sort of painful and cumbersome. Um, very eye-opening for the team I work on because that was kind of their first solution. Oh, they can do Skype. And it was sort of painful for uh, the developers to hear that they don't know about it, they don't want to do it, and even once they do know about it, they're worried about the cost because they already have this slew of things that they're going to have to buy. And as I talked about earlier, Second screens, yes, they're ubiquitous, but they associated this with yet another tax of doing online gaming. So yes, I have to have it. Yes, I do have a phone, but it means I have to have a phone. Or if they were in households where some of the devices were shared, they had to go get the tablet from their brother or sister and set up video chat, which again, could be an extra cost depending on the service you're using. So this, this really was kind of like our, our throwing our solutions out there and having it come back saying, no, it's, it's really not great, I just want to I don't want to have to spend a bunch of money and take a bunch of extra steps just to be as on a fair playing field as the person sitting next to me. So really, it all added up in time, expense, and, and more evidence that they were treated like a second-class citizen. So those are the main themes. Um, here's some of the recap of some of the recommendations. Um, you can see some of the tactile, tactile feedback we talked about. 
We talked about countdowns and matches starting. That was a very interesting part of the study where people talked about in between games and game lobbies. So literally not even knowing when a match was about to be start because you might hear some of the three, two, one in the background or that their friends would say, okay, three, two, one, go. You know, everybody on a destiny raid, we all have to go at this exact time and they couldn't hear about it. So you could imagine, even if you can't control some of the platform features, you could imagine uh, kind of like you can ping a map in an RTS game. Maybe you could have something where you could hit a countdown timer that would appear on the screen so that for people who were playing um, could understand that. And again, I'm guessing that if you're working on a multiplayer game right now, most of the people are playing it without voice, even if they're playing it cooperatively, competitively. So you can imagine something like a countdown timer would work for people who don't want to deal with voice. Um, some of the audio mixing I talked about. Social circles, this is a big one that we're working on in Xbox when we talk about looking for groups and clubs. People want to play with groups of people that they're used to, that they're familiar with, so they won't feel judged. So this was loud and clear with uh, gamers with deafness. Um, there are already websites and, and ways that they try to organize themselves. But we see this with gender. We see this with noobs, you know, or like me, like a, a dad that's got two hours a week to play Destiny. I don't want to play with the people who are raiding every day because they're not going to want to play with me. So how do we do a better job of letting people play with similar groups or people that they're going to feel comfortable playing. And we have that responsibility on the platform side, but I think within games we could do a much better job of it as well. Um, hearing aid integration, not an easy problem to solve, but hopefully we're working on it. Um, some of the visual indication of chat and text in game, I do think people who are designing the games can have an impact on. We talk a lot about these pre-canned messages, you know, Battlefield has them, Destiny has some emotes. Those can be a little tricky, so I don't think there's a great example right now. I couldn't come up with like the gold standard for how you should allow text inside of a game that doesn't require a keyboard, but I do think it's a huge opportunity. I think if people can crack that, um, or even improving on the current keyboard, uh, that's a big opportunity. We, some of the worst feedback we always get is just how hard it is to use a keyboard or the controller. Uh, and then video chat. Again, not easy on an individual game level, but there are ways of doing it or maybe integrating a lot of Twitch integration and Skype integration going on right now. So we do hope that solves some of it. But again, the takeaway there is that, is that you're letting people communicate the way they want to communicate, not that you're just enabling a feature. So that's a bunch of recommendations. Some of them may or may not be useful to you. But really my last recommendation and my, my call to action is content is king. You all work on content. Uh, your content is designed to give users a very specific experience, which is wonderful. Please go out and test that experience on different groups of users, whether it's hearing, vision, mobility, whether it's noobs versus experts. Look at your core audience that you're testing with now and go find specific different groups. Um, much like that curb cutout example, you are going to get insights that you find for this small group that also apply across the board. Uh, I promise you it will not be boring. It will be fascinating. Um, and there's really no... There's no formula to it. You just pick somebody you haven't talked to for a while, go focus on them, and I promise you're going to find fantastic insights for the entire audience. So that's it. Like I said, try to keep it short. I want to thank you. I've got some links if you're interested more on inclusivity and accessibility and some of the stuff we're doing in Xbox and Microsoft as a whole. Uh, we're hiring, so of course I have to say that. Uh, we're also recruiting. If you want to be part of our database, please jump in. I tried to get every form of contact information. I probably missed a few. Um, but please grab me after this. Reach out. I'm always happy to talk about this kind of thing. Um, and maybe in the future, I can come back and do an hour on just the, the bigger project of how we're trying to make sure Xbox and Windows and our experiences are not only accessible, but also more inclusive. So thank you very much. If the question's tough, I'm just going to pretend not to hear it, so go for it. Hi, Tom. Good talk. <laughs> That's um, my old manager that I was just telling you about, so <laughs> we'll see what happens next. <laughs> I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how you found people to test with. Yes, yeah, so this was fascinating. We started off by saying, look, we really want to be in person, especially because of the translator element. So we, um, we said, we're going to do it in Redmond, and we're going to do it in Chicago, and we're going to do all in person, and maybe a week here, a week there. And after a couple of weeks of recruiting, we ended up with maybe like one person at each site. And again, because of some of these insights where people really self-select out of online console gaming because of voice. So what we had to do is get more on the guerrilla recruiting, which was... Um, start targeting specific areas. Uh, Chris was from RIT where they actually had more of a program around gaming and, and disabilities. So he, you know, we talked to him plus a few of his friends. But really we just had to open it up to national. We had to 
um, talk to all these individual communities. We post it on Facebook pages. There's actually quite a few groups that deal with either deafness or gaming or both. Um, there's a lot of experts inside of Microsoft that work with these communities, either through outreach or requirement gathering, even if it's not gaming, so the Office team, the Windows team. Um, so we had a great support group. So once we did that, once we really reached out to all those groups and we made it nationally because it could be online, then people started filing in. But some of the best insights we got were from the basically the rejection email saying, I'd love to do this, but I don't play online, and here's the 10 reasons why I don't play online. And we took all of that and funneled that into this. But it was not, it was not easy. The beauty is it was extreme, they were extremely excited and motivated to talk to us. This is a community that feels like their voice is not being heard. So they were, you know, we just talked to them for hours and had emails. I still have emails going back and forth. As somebody else mentioned earlier, I think about the journal studies, you will get feedback after the studies because they're that excited. Um, but not easy. We're doing actually a, a bunch of usability studies on site, and that's been very difficult to recruit for because it's just a tough audience. Hi. Um, I was wondering um, when you performed the user test, how did you organize some guidelines in order to have a specific type of players uh, in this test? Because not Two days ago, I had um, a participant who was uh, not deaf but had trouble hearing, mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to understand which she did not understand uh, during the playtest. And if you have some guidelines in order to sure, so guidelines for recruiting, who to bring in, and how to sort of put on a piece of paper to gauge their deafness and whether they could speak. Is that what you're asking? Yes, without um, the participant feel uh, excluded from the other players who was with her in the same time. Yeah, so what we, we tried to do was set out some um, questions to really get out if, like I mentioned, if they could rely on voice. So we were looking for people who would not rely on voice in sort of a social gaming session. And we got a range of people. Um, and even people who could speak would say, well, I wouldn't do it because I couldn't hear, right? So they, they could speak during the interview, but they had to use lip reading or sign language. Um, but that, it was very interesting, both from a, um, from trying to map out, like, you know, do I ask, are you deaf on a scale of one to seven? I mean, it wasn't that kind of thing. Um, but also in terms of trying not to insult and trying to understand the language and the context. So one of the things we did was we immersed ourselves with some of the other experts in the group. So what you even see is when I'll say gamers with deafness, because even though some people will call themselves deaf gamers, gamers with deafness, we like to put the person first. You know, it's a person who happens to have some deafness. Um, so we had to really, we kind of had our language evaluated by a couple of experts at Microsoft. But mostly it was, it was sort of a back and forth conversation with recruits to understand if they would identify as someone who had enough hearing and speech problems that they wouldn't want to use, um, uh, use online communication or had done it in the past and then wasn't doing it anymore for those reasons. Um, but again, we actually got a ton of people who responded, but only a small amount of people who were doing that while playing online. So hopefully that answers. But it, it's tricky. I would recommend if you're doing anything with these sort of groups, that you make sure you, you vet your language uh, and you talk to other experts in the field because it's very easy to be, let's say, politically incorrect or cause some kind of problems. Again, we see the same thing with gender or asking about age. Any of those things where you're looking at a group that considers themselves a minority, um, you really have to be careful. And we still had issues. We had still people say, well, I don't have deafness, I'm deaf. And you go, okay, well, you know, I'm trying my best here, right? Um, so you will run into those problems for sure. Hello, Tom. Uh, thank you um, for this presentation. I have a question. I have a multiple question, but it's the, it's the same question. Um, how uh, is it you um, who convinced the team to implement uh, or to change the design of the game? And the next question is: uh, Had you um, some difficulties to convince the teams, and which one? And have you some tips yep. for uh, for that? Yeah, so I wish, I wish I could have the slide at the end that says, here's all the stuff we've fixed, but it's not quite that simple. What we've done is we've done the roadshow where we've presented this around to the folks working on Halo and Forza and Gears of War, um, people working on the hardware team and the platform team. So there are a few fixes and they're addressing a few issues that are coming that I actually couldn't talk about because it's, you know, kind of, would be leaking out new features, but we are, we are, um, having some of these being addressed in future versions of both the games and the hardware. But what I found was mostly was it was bringing these issues to the forefront. So 
they were just like, oh, we should go think about that some more. And that's really what the goal of this was. We picked something very small and very actionable so that we could bring it in front of people. Um, one of the problems you run into with this space is you say, your game should be more accessible or you should make your game work for everybody and that doesn't help. So we said, okay, if we do online gamers and we focus on communication, then we can give the team something to think about. And as soon as we started having those conversations, then we started having another 10 conversations about vision and mobility and all of that. So there are two or three things I'm hoping are gonna get better, but we definitely have maybe another 20 or 30 people now thinking about that that are working on the games and the hardware um, and also the platform. So successful in that route and fingers crossed for the actual impact. What effort you've made. Uh, I was just wondering what effort you made or what you're currently doing to kind of get this research out there because it's quite hard to justify as a studio um, because of what a small percentage of your user base this might make up. Yes. Um, yes. So what have you done? Is there anything you've, is there like uh, online databases or anything like that where developers can go and kind of benefit from the research that you've already done for us? Oh, that, so that's a good question. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't think I have that in, in these links. There are certainly resources you can go. There are certainly communities out there of gamers with deafness or, or um, blind is a little bit tougher because they seem to really self-select out. Um, but there are forums, there are communities, there are you know, Facebook groups that you can go talk to. But uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a huge repository on this exactly for what you're talking about. So again, my, my pitch is you can go and convince your team that you're not doing the work for the small group of people, you're using the small group of people um, as a use case to find insights about the broader group. That's why I was excited about to come do the talk today, because I know almost none of you, none of you are working on platforms, almost, and almost none of you are working with this audience, but I'm hoping to arm you that you can go back and say, it's not that much more expensive, and it may feel niche, but you're going to see insights that apply to everyone. Um, besides that, if you hit me up later, I can try to dig through and, and talk about some of the best practices. I mean, the captioning one is relatively obvious, but I know how expensive that is, especially when you're localizing. Um, and there's probably a few others. And again, if you talk about vision or mobility, I have some kind of recommendations around that too. Okay, I think that's all the time we have right now. I'll talk to you after. Great, thank you. Thanks again.